I want you to remember that no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. You won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. No damn computer's gonna tell me how to do my job. That's the refrain that was heard around the deck plates in 1962 when commanding officers realized that their ships were gonna be equipped with the latest and greatest of NTDS technology. Now we've gone, a, we've gotten a long way from that, right? The way we conduct warfare on a Navy ship, the heart of it is in a computer. Wasn't always like that, right? If we're going back to WW2, a lot of the moving parts all the way up to 1954, the United States Navy, just like every other Navy, relied on human beings. Radar blips of attacking aircraft as well as friendly airplanes were manually picked from radar scopes and manually plotted on backlit plotting tables, right? I'm sure you've seen those in CIC today. Course and speed of the aircraft was manually calculated from the plots of successive radar blips of a target aircraft and then written by hand near the target's plotted track. If it was measured, then you talk, if it was measured by altitude, by height finding radar, they would estimate a fade zone technique. They would use the fade zone technique, right? They would, altitude was penciled in near the track line. You know, the target was known as hostile, friendly, or unknown. You would pencil in hostile, friendly, unknown, use track symbology. But there came a difference between 1944 to end of WW2 and 1954, where we're coming into Korea, jet propelled aircraft that could travel almost twice as fast as their WW2 counterparts showed up. Manual plotting teams, probes, WW2, CICs cannot handle a mass attack with this new high-speed jet aircraft. Why do I why do I provide that historical context? Um, because we're talking about computer systems. Everybody wants to talk about weapons. Everybody wants to talk about little guns. Everybody, but if you really want to win a war in the modern naval battlefield, you have to understand the very computers and components that allow that victory to be possible. The first time they tried to do this automated, they used electromechanical analog computing devices, and they didn't work very well because the high count of moving parts made them unreliable. You got a lot of stuff moving, it's probably gonna break down. Then the Navy tried electronic vacuum tubes. If you're a weapons fire patrolman, you probably learned a lot about vacuum tubes in your schooling. But uh, they didn't work much better because they needed so many tubes. So the final solution came from the Navy code breakers who had in great secrecy um, been using digital computers to decrypt, to decrypt encoded messages. So these code breakers said, hey, why don't you try, you know, we had two, two young Navy EDO commanders. One was an expert in radars, the other was experienced in operational use of radars. Uh, he didn't have that experience, but he'd been in charge of designing and building the Navy's code breaking computers. So a code breaker got together with a with a with, with with somebody who knows about radars, and they said, "Let's come up with this Navy tactical data systems." So that was like one of the first real real computer systems that we had come out. Um, and it's just gotten better ever since. So that's. I say that, and I always try to start with a little bit of background to say why the significance. How does what your what I'm talking about? How does that tie into war fighting? You know, I can sit here and rattle off all these components of a computer, and maybe maybe it'll, it'll stick, and maybe it won't. But understanding the importance and significance of computers in war fighting, I mean, there's nothing that you can't tell by, by just a quick, long, a quick history lesson. So jumping right into it, uh, this first discussion on um, computers comes out of 
electronic technician predominantly out of electronic technician volume uh, six I want to say volume six digital data systems and we're starting prior and there are a few chapters we're going to cover in here that I think are of primary importance and we found on your uh, bibliography uh, if you're a weapons fire controlman Specifically, if you're just a service warrior and interested in electronic technicians and interested in computer components, I, I, I invite you to join. Uh, but this is all distribution statement A, uh, public release unlimited. So we're talking about the fundamentals of computer operations, and I'm going to jump right into it now by talking about computer functions. So what are the functions of, so I'm going to start talking about the functions of a computer. Then I'm going to talk about the modes of operation. All right. So what are the functions of a computer? Very simple. All computers must be able to gather, process, store, disseminate, and display data. I'm going to break down what each one of those words mean in the context of what a computer does. So gather. All computers, no matter what their size, must gather data before they can process the data. The operational program loaded into it will determine uh, what data is being gathered. Okay? Uh, and it'll detect, dictate how the data is being gathered manually, automatically, or a combination of both. Store storage of data. A computer can store data either internally or externally. Internally, the computer uses memory banks. Now, these memory banks hold instructions and both processed and unprocessed data. Memory access time and memory access capacity are the other two main factors that determine how powerful a computer is. So that's what we're talking about storing, right? So processing data. So processing data is the main function and the purpose of the computer. That's the, that's the work product, right? There are other systems, subsystems, and equipment that will work with the computer to help gather, store, disseminate, and display data. But processing is exclusively the computer's function. The heart of the computer, where the data is processed in the computer, is something called the central processing unit. Now, a lot of this stuff seems pretty basic, right? But that's what I'm trying to start with this introduction on the basics of com com computers and computing. Because I, it's really tough when you have all your own systems and what they do and what they're processing and what type of data they're doing and whether they're computing fire control solutions or whatever it is. All these basic principles I'm going over appear in all the computers you'll use. So we said gather. We talked about store. We talked about processing. Talk about disseminating, right? After the computer processes the data, it can, be, it can be used to send to the input output section or an I.O. unit for immediate or future dissemination to various equipment. Now, those output equipment, depending on how old or new your system is, right? Uh, it could be tape disks, mo disks, printers, other subsystems, and it could be to a display unit uh, or it could be to another, another weapon system. So you're taking that information in and... So really simple stuff. Gather a bunch of information, processing the information, storing it, sending it where it needs to go. And so we'll talk about display. So computer systems display two general types of data, right? So I say two types because remember, I'm speaking to you as a technician and as an operator. So they display data related to the mission of the system and the status information related to the operation of the system and the hardware performance. So it's going to rely on computer, peripheral equipment, printers, display units to display process data, the mission related output of the operational data. OK, so your interest as a technician will be whether or not the system is functioning properly. OK. That is system error messages, indications, 
logs, maintenance. Some computers have maintenance panels that have a reg that register the presence or absence of indicator lamps. Um, there could be all kinds of different things that you're using to let the technician to let you as a technician know whether the computer is operating properly. So that's the two types of display maintenance information and, and a lot of systems you may have they may have a complete maintenance panel uh, may, they may have a specific server that just hosts maintenance you may have a, a maintenance console and that'll give you more insights into it uh, so there are certain types of so now we talked about the different ways the different functions of a computer we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of computers that we have, right? So we have old school mainframes, Yuck 7s, right? If you ever seen one of them things, Yuck 43s maybe. They're general purpose, militarized, digital data computers with large scale memories, input output capabilities, multiprocessing capabilities, and they allow a number of CPUs, central processor units, to operate simultaneously in the same system. So the mainframe computers are the largest computers that you're going to ever maintain, right? Their ruggedness, and, and I'm a big fan of, the main, uh, uh, of mainframe computers because their ruggedness make them better suited than microcomputers and mini computers and your little PCs and your laptops to handle mechanical shock and vibration, salt spray, temperature and humidity found on board Navy vessels. So that's kind of, that, that's. And the main pieces of that system are the rugged cabinet. You'll see it. I mean, you can hit that dang with a sledgehammer. It ain't going to dance, right? Your operator console. Uh, your, you will have a remote console. Uh, you have your maintenance console. Um, you'll have your power uh, and various power and cooling requirements. So then you have your mini computers. Uh, so these guys are capable of standalone self-contained operation, or there may be an embedded processor in the system or other type of digital device. They usually have a control and maintenance panel or a computer control panel. So like a mainframe, there's a rugged frame that they're used on board a ship and they're gonna have their own specific cooling. So that's mainframe, mini, and then micro, which is probably going to be what uh, you as a young person is more familiar with not necessarily what your system is or is not going to be right what you may or may not maintain so they're small frame cabinets right they're like pcs right? they're unique in that the frame or cabinet contains the majority of the components of a complete system you'll have just the whole system just in that in that cabinet um, a typical PC frame or cabinet, some, some use the word chassis, some use the word whatever you want to call it. It's going to have a back plane or a motherboard for printed circuit boards, right? So you'll have a whole little circuit card in there. You'll have a central processor unit and a memory printed circuit on the board, right? PCBs, right? We're talking about printed circuit boards, right? So that's like, you know, if you open up your computer, you'll see these little circuit boards. But what you'll have in your microcomputer You'll just have all that in one chassis and just slide it on out, right? And that, the stuff they got nowadays is even more high speed than that. In some cases, the CPU and memory are located on the same PCB. So you'll have your input-output PCB disk controller. You'll have a, a printer circuit board for a video controller. You'll have a printer circuit board for data storage devices. You'll have hard, you'll have... You also have hard disk drive units. You'll have floppy drive units. You'll have CD drive unit. You'll have a tape deck. You'll have some kind of input output connector right audio whatever you want and then you'll have communications they'll have a smaller fan and the beauty of these things is you may not have a special cooling requirement for that system right um ambient room temperature is sufficient for that right and you know you might also you might also have a kvm switch so you can switch to all these different processors at once the keyboard video mouse switch so that's kind of cool uh, and the last thing I'm talking about when we talk about the different computers is micro software. Hold on, got something in my eye right now. Hold on now. Tearing up thinking about these computers. The operational software a microcomputer uses can be off the shelf software, it can be software designed 
by an outside support activity to meet the specific requirements, right? It can be, I mean, this is the software. This is this is the actual program that's loaded, right? If you if you look, if you're thinking about your, your mobile phone, that's like that's like an app. Okay. So before a microcomputer must can be maybe used, you must configure and set up your software. When configuring and setting up the software for a microcomputer, there's several things you got to be aware of. You got to customize the operating system. Um, you have to follow the step-by-step -step procedures in the guide. Right? I'm just going to do it eyes closed, right? Because there's something in my eyes. You got to follow the step-by-step -step procedure in the guide. So a lot of the system weapon systems that you'll, that you'll deal with, a lot of systems on board ship that you'll deal with, you'll find that one of the first things that you'll have to learn with great deal of precision is software load procedures, right? Because you're going to have to make sure that you load that weapon system precisely the way um, that the manufacturer wants it. Uh, in order for it to be successful, and and I and I stress that because those of you that work on various systems, you know that if this if the initial software load is not configured properly, you won't have any success. So that's one of those you need absolute attention to detail. And when you do it, you you'll want to do the reader worker method, right? No matter how many times you do a software load or, or reload, what you want to make sure is that there's always someone over your shoulder making sure you're following every single step to make sure that it's done effectively. Um, so I, I said we would talk about modes of operation, so I'm going to talk about that really quick. Uh, and I'm really just going to touch on battle short. It's very important. So battle short mode is used when it becomes necessary to run the computer continuously, even though an over temp condition exists, right? If you fighting, you know, one of our great power, a great power competitor, right? China, Russia, Iran, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, right? You know, if it's too hot, you're not gonna say, "Hey, we're gonna turn off the weapon," right? You're gonna put it in a battle short. The activation of a battle short, well, depending on whatever your ship does and how they do it and who wants to allow it to happen, you know, I don't know the precise rules governing that, but that's just something that you want to keep in mind. Now, the battle short switch will bypass over temperature protection interlocks and power will be maintained to the computer for continued operation. An over temperature condition is a result of a failed assembly or inadequate cooling. Uh, so that's what over temp is. So if it gets too hot, if you know what the, it's not cool enough, that's what's going to call the over temp. Uh, and it only exists usually in battle conditions. Uh, some computers are going to be equipped with a horn to warn if an over temp condition exists. So usually if you ever walk into a room with your equipment and you hear alarms going off, you know, these machines don't make a whole lot of alarms, right? It's not like a like a microwave that's going to ding when you're done or, or tell you when something's incoming. It's not that kind of, you're not on a display console. So usually if you hear, if you walk into a space and you hear a sound, Either you're in over temp condition or there's something wrong with your power supply, right? That's kind of what causes bells and whistles to go off in your space. Uh, and the last thing I'll talk about is ADP. So ADP is anything that has to do with safe, the safety of the computer, uh, the physical security of the equipment, um, all that good stuff, right? That's ADP, right? So your ADP is you are focused on ADP security, okay? So um, there's a lot of ADP security factors that you can need to know. Password, complexity, uh, you know, how you're safeguarding information, things like that. So with that, I don't have um, anything else on this subject. 